Our next speaker is Sham Kakat from the University of Washington. Um, his work is looking into the theoretical foundations um, of machine learning, looking at uh, reinforcement learning control, but also other areas such as natural language processing. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us, I think, about. Um, do, we, do you have the slide? Um, a theoretical result on, on adaptive control and no regret bounds. Okay, excellent. Uh, hi everyone, and uh, definitely a big thanks to the organizers and the behind the scenes support for bringing uh, us all together. It's a pretty uh, great and diverse community that they're trying to set up. So today uh, we'll be looking at some questions with regards to uh, robustness in a control setting. And part of the reason we're here is because a lot of uh, the excitement with regards to utilizing controls in a broader set of applications. And uh, with this uh, excitement in terms of downstream applications, there's an uh, increasing need to get uh, robust control algorithms, and in particular, provably robust control algorithms, as uh, basically because many people, uh, as many people have pointed out today, uh, it, unlike super, supervised learning, uh, in these control settings, we often don't have a very good idea of the potential use cases where, in which we're going to deploy these systems. So in supervised learning, we often have these nice test distributions, test, uh, test distributions we can figure out how well our system will do. But in these control settings, uh, we're often going to deploy our system, and we really would like the system itself to have some notion of how it's going to be robust to the particular setting it's in. Okay, and uh, let's study these questions in the context of uh, the stylized model, namely linear quadratic regulators. Uh, while it's a stylized model, it's a surprisingly good locally linear model and utilized in many settings. Okay, so we've seen this model before, but just to make sure we're familiar with notation, uh, you know, normally I, I'm an SA kind of guy, but uh, working in uh, controls has moved me to XU. So uh, we're going with XU notation, where our dynamics uh, of uh, you know, some state vector XT, our next state vector is going to be some uh, linear combination of a previous state vector by A, plus some matrix B times a control, uh, plus some kind of disturbance. And, uh, and typically, our goal is to come up with some uh, sequence of controls chosen adaptively to minimize some uh, objective function related to, often related to some kind of stability of the system. And in many, in some cases, we think about these disturbances as coming from uh, some distributional model like Gaussian. In other cases, we think about these, uh, these disturbances, WT, as be being chosen adversarially. And there's kind of a lot of uh, both old and new work on this problem. We've heard about some of the newer work on this problem uh, at this workshop. And, and today we're going to look at a question related to robustness uh, in this setting. And let me define, uh, you know, specify the model a little more broadly, and then we'll get to uh, specifying what we mean by robustness in a moment. So uh, now let's just consider a setting where the costs, uh, they don't have to be quadratic. Let's consider the cost to be convex. Uh, it's nice to generalize the cost to be convex uh, for some reasons, because sometimes when you have constraints, it might be more natural to put your constraints in the system like soft constraints, because uh, sometimes that's easier to work with. Uh, but we'd like to be able to deal with convex costs. Uh, the dynamics model is the same. Let's assume we know A and B for a moment. And these disturbances, WT, we're going to think about them as being adversarially chosen. Uh, OK. so. Uh, and what we're interested in is, can we provide some way to obtain a provably correct, robust control algorithm? Okay, and, and in particular, we want to do this in a manner that, you know, we don't want to, in a sense, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, we want, like, a robust control algorithm that somehow is still practically uh, effective. And there's a sense in which, uh, at least in some settings, notions like H infinity control might be very, very pessimistic. Uh, and uh, let's start, before I define uh, the notion of robustness we can consider, let's just start by reviewing the classical notion of H infinity control. Okay, so uh, 
Uh, so what is H infinity control? Uh, it's basically a min-max game where we're trying to find some adaptive controller u. So u is the control we're going to do at time t. It's a function of the previous states we've seen. And, uh, and then nature gets to be adversarial. And let's say nature is subject to the constraint that the sum of the squares of the disturbances are bounded. Okay, and this is the, uh, you know, some variant of this is basically the classic H infinity uh, control problem. And for the case of quadratic cost, this is efficiently computable. OK, so, uh, so this is a worst case notion of how to be robust against uh, some kind of bounded controls. And note there's no distributional assumption here uh, about the disturbances. All that's really being assumed is that the, you know, the sum of the squares of your disturbances are bounded, and you want to be robust against that. Okay, so if there's questions, feel free, to, uh, feel free to ask. I can always repeat the question. Uh, so, so let me know if something isn't clear, and I'll just repeat the question. OK, so before we motivate uh, the consideration of a different notion of robustness, uh, let's just examine this notion of robustness in a very concrete setting. So let's start with a very simple toy example, where example has no dynamics at all. OK, so this is an example where uh, x is a scalar, u is a scalar, a is 0, and b is 0. Uh, and it's basically a game. Uh, at time t, we're going to choose some real number ut. Okay. The nature after us is going to choose some scalar wt, the disturbance. And let's say wt is in some bounded set between minus 1 and 1. Okay. And after nature is chosen, we're going to incur the cost, which is the square difference between these two. This is a super simplified version of robust control where we get rid of dynamics. And if you think about this for a while, uh, the, the best thing you could do in a min-max sense is to always say 0. Because uh, if you say something different from 0, uh, nature is going to give you more uh, a higher cost. Okay, so as long as somehow nature is constrained in a symmetric, like if we say 0.5, nature will say minus 1, and we'll pay 1.5 squared. Okay, so the best we can do is always play 0. Okay, but suppose for a moment we're playing this game, and we see something like you know, 0 0.31, 0 0.32, uh, 0 0.29, uh, and basically things that seem to be around 0.3. Okay, it seems pretty natural that in this particular game, uh, we might want to actually play something nearer to 0.3. Okay, but uh, in this worst case sense, we should never do that, because if we do that, we're going to have uh, a higher cost. Okay, so uh, in simple settings like this, the, the type of method seems to be a bit pessimistic, because if we actually saw this, there's a case to be made that maybe we should do something different. Uh, but on the other hand, would we be throwing out robustness if we started playing something like 0.3? Okay, so. That's right, that's right. So, so even here, as long as that, uh, it, so it's bounded in the L2, that would be the sum of the squares so, so, uh, of the WT. Uh, but if the budget is big, uh, so, so the, all that really matters here is that the constraint set for nature is symmetric. So if the budget is big, you know the nature is uh, spending things. But the min-max strategy, as long as it's symmetric in a pretty general sense, is going to be play zero all the time. Um, so, uh, so you're right. So I'm a bit hand wavy in this example as to what the constraint set is. But this is really true for any kind of a symmetric constraint set. And, uh, and there's a sense in which you might not want to play all zeros all the time. Okay. And is there a way to? Uh, to modify this, uh, but still have a notion of robustness. Okay, and this is going to motivate us to consider uh, a regret minimization notion, which is uh, we'd like to compete well in hindsight against the best linear policy, for example. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So I'm subtracting off this term in red, and that's a counterfactual notion in that uh, at the end of the game. I could hypothetically look at what happened if I utilized a linear policy. And, uh, but when I execute the linear policy, I see what would happen right from the beginning of the game. So if I use k, I could start at the beginning of the game and follow my dynamics through 
and see what I would have gotten had I played this in entirely different strategy, propagating it through the dynamic. Okay, so uh, it's a counterfactual notion because uh, if I played k at time t, I wouldn't necessarily be at the same state I was actually at. Okay, so we could ask the question of how do I make this quantity small in a min-max sense? Okay, but note now we're subtracting off this term in red. Okay, and this x hat of t in this notion is the evolution of the system under a different model. Okay, so questions about this notion? Okay, so, uh, and here we're going to consider these WTs, say, being bounded uniformly. Uh, so at every time t, we're going to say WT is bounded, but we're still going to be min-max in that in the worst case, we would like this regret to be bounded. Okay, and, and let's just spend a moment comparing this, uh, these two notions. So this H infinity notion is trying to say our cost is small on the sequence, subject to some constraints of nature. Okay, we want an adaptive policy such that against any way nature plays subject to some constraints, uh, our actual cost is small. Okay, now this low regret notion, there's a sense in which you could argue it's more like uh, an instance-wise optimal uh, worst case notion in which on the instance we happen to see, we'd like our cost to be close to that. So it's still robust, but we're comparing ourselves to uh, this counterfactual notion, which is had we gone with, say, some fixed linear policy, uh, how well do we compare to that? And we're comparing ourselves to the best linear policy. Okay, so uh, this, these no regret notions, uh, they're actually widely studied in machine learning. And, in, uh, and actually in optimization, they come up as well. And the roots really go back uh, to game theory due to some results of uh, David Blackwell on approachability, because in a sense, after uh, von, von Neumann's minimax theory, uh, there was a lot of work on learning in games and questions about what can we guarantee in a sequential setting. Uh, and some of the earlier results there were with regards to Blackwell's approachability results and James Hahnen's results. And they were particularly interested in guaranteeing uh, some, strategy, some quantity approaches something. And in our setting, what we would like is our average regret to approach zero. Or another way to put this, we would like uh, this cumulative regret. So that's the, the quantity on the right. We would like that quantity to grow at a rate that's slower than order t. Because if that happens, uh, what that implies is that the average cost of our algorithm will actually be uh, about as good as this comparison, so will be about as good as had we used the Beck's uh, linear policy. Okay. And uh, that's why, uh, so it's this approaching notion that we'd like that to occur for a large t. Okay. But we'd like this to occur for all sequences. So it's a worst case guarantee uh, is what we're going for. Okay, and in this toy example, it's not too hard to convince yourself that uh, basically, uh, essentially, the best strategy is to play the best thing in the past. So you would play something close, close to like three, and this is going to be a good strategy uh, essentially on all sequences. Okay, it'll actually get sublinear regret, uh, and it's a very good strategy, and it's a worst case strategy. Okay, but what's subtle in our setting is that we're comparing ourselves to this counterfactual notion because we kind of can't go back and change what we did in the past. Right? We might want to be at a different state, but we can't because we already played the actions in the past. Okay, so uh, can we make this guarantee be sublinear? And can we do this in a manner that gives us, say, a practical algorithm? Okay, so questions about the, the statement? So there's a sense in which, you know, if you're familiar with H infinity, I wanted to phrase this in a way that isn't such a big leap from H infinity to consider this min-max game with an additional term. And that additional term, uh, there's a case to be made that's more like, that's forcing you to consider something more akin to an instance optimal notion of optimality. OK, so our main result actually shows that uh, this is possible, meaning for every sequence, 
so an adversarially chosen sequence, as long as each entry is bounded, say, by 1, you can actually make this regret so we can make our cost on the sequence, compare it to the best linear policy. I'll define that subscript in a moment. We can make that to be growing uh, less than something linear in big T. So big T is the, the number of rounds we played this game. Okay, so this means, on average, our performance is going to be not much worse than the best fixed linear adaptive policy. Okay, and again, we're comparing ourselves to this uh, counterfactual notion. Again, I'm only showing you the T dependence, and there's uh, a number of uh, other factors that have to do with the dimension, uh, some spectral norms of these matrices A and B. And in particular, if you think about this, some notion of the stability of the system has to come into play. And you know, there's been recent ways to characterize uh, the stability of systems in this paper by Cohen, but we're going to go with this notion that has something to do uh, with quantifying a notion of the spectral radius of the comparator class. So what we're, we're really comparing ourselves is not necessarily to all K, but to all linear mappings that induce some bounded spectral radius on the system. Uh, because you know, as the spectral radius approaches uh, something very near to 1, uh, this is going to become inc increasingly difficult. So you can look at the paper for details. Uh, but the main point is, in a worst case sense, uh, we can robustly say the performance that we're going to obtain is going to be close to how do we gone with the best fixed linear mapping. Okay. So now how do we ensure this, and what does the algorithm look like? So I'll sketch things out, and I really want to give you a flavor of what the algorithm looks like, and, uh, and I want to make the case that the algorithm looks like a pretty practical algorithm as well. Okay, so questions just about the statement or any notation? No. So, so this is for. Is this the pop singular? You're putting it down on singular value or on the eigenvalue? Pop eigenvalue? Uh, it's actually on. Uh, you can think about it more like a decomposition, but this paper by Cohen, uh, we're assuming that A plus BK has some kind of decomposition and we're bounding properties of that de decomposition. So uh, it's a pretty natural way to view things. Actually, this paper with that Maria mentioned, we probably should have written in this, in this manner. And I think this would be. Uh, something where the interplay with the controls computer would help. It would really would be nice to have ways to uh, robustly quantify the stability of these systems. And to my knowledge, this is one of the, the cleanest general ways uh, to do this. Okay, but I would be very happy to, to, to look at this. But there's no assumptions about symmetric uh, systems. This really, you know, I, I would say this is pretty general. Uh, okay. So the question is really just about stability and is this an, is this an eigenvalue? condition, or are we making symmetry assumptions? And the short answer is no. We're really leveraging some ideas from some recent results for ways to quantify uh, the stability of systems. OK, so let me uh, sketch the outline of the approach and some of the issues. OK, so uh, the first issue is that suppose we actually knew these w's in advance. OK, basically computing that value of the right-hand term is tricky. Uh, we don't know how to do that. Uh, and the way these algorithms work is that typically it, it's very helpful to at least be able to compute uh, what, the best you know, what your best comparative policy would look like. And even just computing the best k for an arbitrary sequence of the w, uh, we don't know how to do. Uh, but we can essentially relax the policy by considering a much broader policy class. Uh, and let me just sta state in words uh, for this slide what the policy class we're going to consider uh, looks like. OK, and it's essentially going to be working in, in, what something, in a policy that you could describe as an error feedback policy. OK, so what you're going to first do is, at time t, you're going to look at what you would play if the world was nice. So like, get rid of all the w's, uh, the disturbances. Look at what you would do if the world was nice. Okay. And now we're going to try to adjust what we do based on some small history of the previous disturbances that we observed, which is a pretty natural algorithm. You try to adjust what you would do based on some short window of the 
the previous disturbances you happen to observe. Okay, and then based on that, we're going to plug this into some type of no regret algorithm. So, so that's uh, Pablo. So against which class of policies are you comparing yourself? We're comparing ourselves to uh, the set of best linear policies subject to some uh, decay condition. Well, the dimension of the problem is fixed. No, no, but, but you, could, you could have an infinite dimensional controller for exactly. oh, it. Exactly. It's, it's a linear in the current state. So it's, it's all right. So it's linear in the current state. But it turns out the way the proof works, we're actually going to be looking at a more general class of, uh, of comparisons. It's just going to be something that contains this controller. So, so I was asking, are we, uh, in a sense, linear in the current state or something to do with the history? And let me just give you the actual class we work with. Uh, and then this will uh, might help to make things a little more clear. So a linear policy at time t plus 1 would just be uh, some linear mapping k times our current state. Okay, and uh, computing the best k in this problem is actually, uh, we don't know how to do it. It's not, not only non-convex, but we actually don't know how to do it because these w's are changing. Uh, but we can kind of broaden the set of policies, essentially using an idea related to uh, this uh, system level synthesis uh, framework. It's a little simple in our setting, but what we're going to do is instead of consider a policy that's linear in the current state, we could consider a policy that's linear in the previous disturbances. Okay, and it's not too hard to convince yourself that a policy that's linear in the previous disturbances that contains the class of policies that's linear in the state. Okay, and, and that's essentially what's going on behind the scenes in this uh, uh, system level synthesis viewpoint of Martini and co-authors. It's, it's a bit simpler here because we just directly work uh, by a policy that's linear in the disturbances. Okay, so uh, step one is rather than work with linear policies, Let's work with mappings that are linear in the previous disturbances. And the nice thing about this, okay, you know what, this, this is there's an easy way to see why this makes the problem look convex. But the key point is if we work in this different parameterization, which is uh, richer than these um, uh, linear mappings on the state, we actually get a convex problem uh, if we just want to solve the problem of what would have been the best thing to do in the past. Okay. If we just wanted to answer that problem, this viewpoint of working with linear mappings on the disturbances, that makes things nicely convex. So, so that's just observation one, uh, which is really due to uh, some work uh, by Martini and co. It might, I, I suspect it's an earlier idea. Okay. Um, Okay, but the challenge here is how do we actually get at this notion of counterfactual regret? Okay, so, and how long of a window do we actually have to work with? Because we're going to look at some history of disturbances, uh, but you know, what window size do we need, and how do we ensure stability? Okay, so the actual policy class that we're going to use, uh, it actually looks very natural. You could think of it like some kind of feedback control policy. So, uh, so Russ Tedrick was talking about uh, various feedback control policies. And this is going to be looking at a feedback control policy where we're going to take into account our disturbances to adjust our controller. OK, so the form we work with is that uh, if there was no disturbances at all, let k be, say, the best thing, the, the, the best action. Okay, so. Uh, if there's no disturbances or Gaussian noise, we can definitely compute the best linear mapping. Okay, and let that be k. Okay. But what we're going to work with is what we're going to execute is not k times xt. We're going to execute k times xt plus some adjustment based on some window, uh, some linear mapping based on the window of the last few disturbances. Okay, so uh, you look at what you would have done and you consider adjusting it based on these some the last h disturbances. Okay, and you would like to learn these linear mappings m. Okay, so the parameters in this policy parameterization are m1 to mh. And at time t, we're going to execute some control signal 
that lives in this class of uh, controllers. Okay. Uh, again, this is really just about representation, and it doesn't tell us how we're going to adjust the m's over time or ensure that uh, we're going to get this low regret guarantee. Okay, but there are questions about uh, the actual space of the model. Uh, and this is actually a pretty natural model space. So those of you who are familiar with these models like uh, iterative learning control and error feedback control, uh, they basically work with, with parameterizations like this. So uh, I'll just state the algorithm. Uh, and it's a very natural algorithm. OK, so, uh, so roughly, here's the way the algorithm works. It's iterative. We're going to start it with some m1 to mh. So these are the parameters. And m vector is just going to denote the concatenation. OK, so we're at some time t. We just execute the control based on, uh, you know, k is fixed. We compute it offline. And we execute it based on our current linear mapping of the previous disturbances. OK, so we just execute it. OK, then we observe some new state. Okay. But based on the new state we observe, we can figure out this disturbance because that's just the error in our model. So now we know uh, wt, or wt plus 1, because that's the error we made. Okay. And now the question is, how do we update the m's? Okay, well, we actually know all the disturbances. So these are all the mismatches. Okay, and then at time t, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct this counterfactual loss function uh, the semantics of uh, which that had I used some other policy m vector right from the beginning, what would I have paid at time t? Okay, so you start at time 0, I simulate m all the way, and look at the cost I would have gotten at time t based on the state I would have gotten to had I done something differently. Okay, so it's a, it's a subtle notion here because it's actually taking into account uh, the state dynamics effect of what, what would have happened had we done something differently. Okay, so it's this counterfactual notion. And once we have this counterfactual loss at time t, we're literally just going to take a gradient step on a controller uh, at time t. There could be other methods, like a Newton step and so on. But we construct this counterfactual loss. It turns out it's actually convex. And then you can show that essentially using some machinery uh, and online convex optimization with memory, you can show this actually will achieve low regret. Okay. And uh, just wrapping things up, uh, this uh, point in blue, this is uh, actually very related to these methods that people do in practice based on error feedback control and iterative learning control, where they, you know, they basically try to adjust what they do based on the disturbances they just saw in the last episode. You know, it's like, they shoot an arrow, it's off target. Uh, it, bit to the right, they're just going to shoot, do the same thing again, but shoot a little more leftward. Okay? And we're trying to make formal connections there. Uh, but overall, the spirit of this work is trying to consider different min-max notions to uh, possibly get something more akin to in, more instance-optimal ways to do robust control. Uh, there are many open questions here, such as, uh, we've given an upper bound on the min-max value of the game, but it'd be very nice to sharply pin this down, even for the special case of quadratic loss functions, we haven't sharply pinned this down. Uh, and this has worked with a number of super talented colleagues, uh, Alad Hazan and Karan Singh, Brian and Naman. Uh, Karan, Brian, and Naman did a lot of the, the heavy lifting here, and you know, they were just great collaborators. And thank you very much. So there's a question by Don in the very back. Can we get the mic up? Um, I can, I'll repeat it. Okay. What would happen if you just use the M? Don't do a gradient. Um, is that going to be just too aggressive or what? Well, OK, so how do you start the M? If you start the M's at all 0, then you're not adapting at all. No, but you're going to get an M at some point. Right. And you're not going to use the M. You're going to use the M to construct a K. Well, what would no, 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 we're, we're, actu we're actually. Sorry, uh, just, just to be clear. Uh, yeah, so, so just to be clear, k we compute at the beginning as if there were no disturbances, and we fix k. Okay, and we're always augmenting k with the policy of this form. So we're always using m uh, because that's what's giving us the, the adaptivity based on the previous disturbances. So we're always using the m and we're always updating m 
and, and playing that. Right, so, so once we have the M, we get a new disturbance, and now we need to update M because the key is that since these WTs are arbit you know, chosen adversarially, we don't know what the M is in advance, and uh, the optimal algorithm is actually going to be changing the M along the way based on what it's seen. Okay, and this is the update scheme. Okay, there's one question here. So one of the nice things of H infinity is that it turns out that the optimal controllers have also finite dimension, right? They're, it, fin it they're finite dimensional, right? Is, do you think something like this will be true in here? I mean, somehow This is a really good uh, question that uh, I'm not, like, the, census, the system level of synthesis approach, like, mathematic is very elegant, but it seems very wasteful in the parameterization. Uh, and, you know, your question is about, is something finite dimensional, but we don't even I mean, know. In the infinite horizon. In the infinite horizon. Yeah, well, yeah. we know it's uh, finite in the sense that once we restrict to strongly stable, we're only looking at a particular window uh, for, uh, in our, in our uh, we only have to look at some particular window of the previous disturbances. Okay, so only comparing to strongly stable that under a certain parameter, so we're only looking at the previous uh, so, so k, uh, so you know, so we have a fixed k, but we're only looking at a particular window, and we're getting the guarantee based on that. So no, there's a sense in which uh, we it is finite dimensional in terms of the no, no, the disturbances. but I'm saying, I mean, if you have like a second order system, for instance, if we have the, a what a second order system, then you know the optimal H infinity control. Oh, I will see. Also so, the, so that I, that I don't know. Uh, I mean, I I think there's a lot of nice questions. Even just a clean characterization of the min max value of this game when things are quadratic, it's fresh. Like we can't figure this out. And I would bet it's log t. I, I don't see why it's root t here. Uh, okay, there was one more question up um, there. Two more questions. Okay. Often dynamics are partially observed. Um, how would you extend this to partially observed x? Is it as easy as throwing in a Kalman filter, or do you need to be more careful with managing uncertainties? Uh, off the top of my head, now that you mention it, I'm not convinced it's that much more difficult because because uh, somehow, if you're willing to blow up the, the policy space like we are being linear in the previous disturbances, I think that gives you a lot of power to deal with partial observability. Uh, so in a sense, in this, what I would call, call this over-parameterized policy class, it probably works pretty well in, for the partially observed case. Uh, but I, I'd have to think about that a little more, a little more carefully. Because you know, estimating the disturbance is a little subtle now. Uh, yeah, so, so, so I guess the issue is you don't really observe the disturbance, so this has got to be, uh, so something's probably subtle there. So there's one more. I, I want to go back to John's question earlier. So the online adaptive control that you're really talking about is with respect to the disturbance and not with respect to the AB model. Like John mentioned, John Sitziklis mentioned, that's the messy problem, that the original K, when you have it, if it's not stabilizing for the A and B, unless you do something with the gradients, you're not going to get out of the woods. But what you are addressing, if I'm correct, is the adaptation to W, the disturbance, and not with respect to the yes, mod so, parameters. So, so in a sense, uh, we aren't saying that there is model uncertainty. Or a different way to put it is, you know, all of these things have to do with uh, what's the right notion of uh, robustness that you want to consider because you can always kind of force model uncertainty into uh, uncertainties in the W's because uh, that'll just imply some kind of bound on the W's. But in some cases, uh, that's not the, the nicest way to do things. But I think there is a, uh, but we don't know how to handle any notion of regret when we say A and B, say, live in some uh, set. So I think this is a good question to do something more uh, instance optimal. Right. Okay, I think uh, we stop here. Uh, we have a coffee break now. We all come back at uh, four for two more exciting talks. And with that, let's thank uh, Sam again.